Ladies and gentlemen, we now start our conversation by asking the central question. If we could imagine, shape, and inspire the future, what would that future look like? Now this is a large question, and so we hope that as we proceed with the conversation, we will come up with some interesting and constructive ideas about how to contribute to an inclusive future. I have with me on stage this morning an outstanding panel comprising two awardees of the Ramon Aksaisai Awards Foundation. Anshu Gupta is the founder of Budge, which has transformed the way we look at clothing we do not want, clothing that we throw away, by creating an ecosystem which connects the waste with the needs of poor people. We have attorney Lilia de Lima, who was recognized by the Ramon Sai Sai Awards Foundation for greatness of spirit demonstrated when she was Director General of the Philippine Economic Zone Authority, which she transformed from commitment with commitment and integrity. We have two young founders of two significant but different kinds of organizations. We have next to me, Stephanie C, who was recognized recently by Forbes, who listed her as amongst 30 in Asia under the age of 30. She is the founder of the artificial intelligence company called Thinking Machines, in which she is, she designates herself as the chief data scientist, Stephanie. We have young Amanda Widdarmono from Indonesia, who at the age of 26 established an organization known as We the Teachers to help the teachers of Southeast Asia's largest country teach more effectively. Welcome, Amanda. And last but not least, we have Prince Dr. Fata from the Brunei Royal Family, who is the chairman of Brunei's most dynamic bank, Baiduri Bank, founded by his father, Prince Mohammed. Welcome. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the question is how we can reimagine and create a better future. But before we get to that question, I'd like to ask, why should we bother? Why should we not focus on just enriching our own lives? Why should we bother about the communities beyond our organizations? I'd like to start with Amanda. Amanda, you were educated in the United States. You came back to Indonesia. At the age of 26, what triggered you to found We the Teachers? Why did you bother? Oh, wow, why did I bother? Um, thank you, Dato Timothy, for the kind introduction. It's very nice to be here and to exchange thoughts with everybody. Um, and I hope it's going to be an interesting discussion ahead. So why bother? I think um, this reminds me of a recent visit to a city in East Java where my grandmother lives. And um, it was just three years ago that she was fascinated by this with this very fancy thing called WhatsApp where people could communicate, people could form groups, and then gossip spread way faster than um, it 
should be in her times. And uh, now, three, uh, three years later, she actually has a smartphone on her hand and she understands the concept of Uber Eats that when it's those lazy nights when we don't want to eat uh, or cook, eat out or cook, we can get food delivered to our home. And I think technology does democratize a lot of interactions in uh, human life. It democratizes communication. Um, in our field, education, it democratizes um, access to information as well. And why do we bother? Because we need to stay relevant to what's going on. Because in the real sector, in the classroom uh, where we're working at, or if we talk about other sectors the, uh, of the economy, it could be farming, it could be manufacturing, we should bother because then if we stay exclusive, if we don't follow the openness and the interconnectedness of all these systems, history has shown us that it only leads to isolation, it only leads to stunted growth, um, and when it's the stunted growth of an individual, I think that is something that maybe can be mitigated, but when it's the stunted growth of a society, of a community, of a village, of a country, especially so in Southeast Asia where the population are especially young compared to other parts of the world. I think it is our responsibility to bother. And um, again, why bother? Because I think every individual in this room does have a role to play in creating a more inclusive world. Thank you, Amanda. Turn to Steph. Stephanie. Um, Stephanie, you, I imagine, are primarily preoccupied with disruption, technological disruption. How do you see the connection between what you do and the community at large? All right. Hi. Um, thank you for having me here. Uh, I am, I'm far more comfortable coding in a basement than I am on stage here. <laughs> um, just pretend, just, just pretend yeah. you're in a basement. <laughs> right, right, right. This is a basement. This is a TV screen. Uh, but the reason why I'm here is because um, I think that technology is changing the world. Um, we have already disrupted the tech sector. We've disrupted a lot of, a, a lot of industries, a lot of economies, and we're going to continue to do so. Um, and it is healthy. We must engage with society. Otherwise, we will not be building effective technology. We will not be building technology that helps make things equal. Um, a lot of tech is built to scale. The downside of scaling is actually that it magnifies inequality. If you train artificial intelligence on historical data, uh, that is already biased, that is already reflective of our worst natures. We're just encoding and embedding those biases um, into decisions that these algorithms make for us. Uh, the only way to get past that is for people like me to get out of the basement uh, and come here and talk to all of you. I'm, I'm just, and I will come back to you on this, because if you listen to the discussions going on, there is a tension between people who are optimistic about the possibilities of technology and some of the trends taking place in the world today. And, and I'm just wondering whether these are two separate conversations or whether they can be connected because when you talk to one group, you can have a completely different view from when you talk to the other group. But we'll, we'll come back to that because I want to go to Anshu. Anshu, a number of years ago, you decided to devote your life to the poor and marginalized in your country, India. Now, India is today one of the fastest growing economies in the world, but it is highly unequal. And we are interested to know what triggered off that decision. Why did you, why did you care? Why did you walk off? So, you know, to be honest, when I, when I started, it was something which started bothering when you started. And then you grow because every day you get bothered further about it. And, and someone who is coming from a very beautiful but an honest middle class family of India, I personally feel that I want to do it because, because I have to pay back. And pay back not in a fancy term the way people talk about it because I, I feel that I have eaten up the, eaten up the subsidy of, of, of my country. Because the kind of institutions where most of us are studying, 
and the kind of subsidy we get so that our middle class families can afford that. The fact remains that 70-80% of the population of our countries do not get the same thing. So somewhere, somewhere is it, is it that, that amass. And today, to be honest, I also want to, want to break this entire arrogance of the people you know, who wear good clothes or who can speak more than their own language. Somewhere the most important point for me or, or for the institution and for the whole lot of us is that how do we how do we break that entire thought process of you know terming someone as beneficiary and treating yourself as, as donor? Treating someone who is not wearing good clothes as unskilled, uneducated, whatever, and treating yourself as someone who can think of the problem and think of the solution. So it's, it's a much, much larger, larger game. I mean, I'm, I'm really questioning that someone who designs this all on a piece of paper in our language is called a skill. And someone who does it brick by brick is called unskilled. Is that sheer arrogance which somewhere we need to break because at the end of the day, all of us talk about data, all of us talk about technology, all of us think that GDPs and many new, you know, new terms are the symbol of the progress of the world. But all of us exactly know that in our lifetime, the poverty is only grown, the water is gone down, the education, especially the government education in most of the countries is totally messed up, the migration is up, and, and we are at a stage where we are actually worried about our future. It's not, so somewhere it is not a choice. I believe that it's a compulsion that people who have something, people who can afford to do it, we, we deliver, we do it, because, because it is a compulsion also, it's not just by choice. So it's not a choice, it's a necessity. I, at some point I'd like to get your views on how this sits with the work that you do, the challenges you face, how this connects to the amazing possibilities of technology that we have been hearing about. Is that technology irrelevant? Is it, can it be harnessed? Um, or is it, does it have a life of its own? Uh, we'll return to that. I'm, I want to now turn to Prince Fahad. Prince Fahad, you are a member of one of Asia's most privileged and wealthiest families. You are the chairman of a bank, very successful, created by your father. Why should you bother? Very good question. Very pointed question, if I should say. <laughs> Why should we bother? Uh, I think because uh, I do care. I mean, it's it's a it's we are part of society. So even as part of the royal family, it's an issue that we have to we have to look at. So I mean, even listening to the stories this morning. From the lady from Indiana, it does touch my heart. I mean, I'm not that cold. <laughs> so, like, like you and everyone in the room, I think that we have to try to do better for the future. I mean, it's not only for us, but it's also for the future generations, the people here, the under 35s, the 39s, and their children and their children's children. So it's quite key. And I have to take this uh, lesson of the history. I mean, kings thrive on the on the love of their people, on the love of their subjects. So as a prince I have a duty to my country, my king, and my people. So that is why I should vote that in this room. Thank you very much. Lydia, you were a distinguished civil servant. You went into a dysfunctional organization called the Philippine Economic Zone Authority. You transformed that organization and you transformed it with dedication and with integrity, probably through a number of years when integrity was not in fashion. What was the difference with you? Why did you bother? Thank you for the question. As you can see, my orientation is government service, quite different from the other panelists who have all come from the private sector. Of course, 
I needed to buy. The crying need of our country, where a population of 103, 105 million Filipinos, half of which are below 23 years old, or the 23 years old and below. And the crying need of our country is jobs, jobs, and more jobs. So, we were lucky that the law, the agency I headed, was mandated to promote exports, um, promote investments, generate exports, and create jobs. And that was a big opportunity for us to bother, to care, um, because, you know, this, this, uh, our population, the need, the crime need is jobs. And with our population, it's both a challenge and an opportunity. Now, it is an opportunity because if we could educate our people, this half, 50% who are below 23 years old, what a big opportunity they will be, these people who are liabilities could now be assets to our country, if we could educate them, they will be a potent force for our country's economic development. They can get jobs, they can be entrepreneurs, they can even be future leaders. They can maybe, um, as future leaders, they can chart the destiny of our country, maybe even empower themselves and uh, by doing so i think we'll have a good place it will be, 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 be very much good for our country so we bother we we made a difference and we're happy that we made a difference by the way uh, because of that mandate PESA was mandated to create to, to uh, create jobs. Our scorecard after 21 years, we created at least 6 million jobs that benefited at least 13 million Filipinos all over the country. Thank you.